Blatt. I'm your host, Tom Kearns, and welcome to the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. Episode 9, Oswald, King and Martyr. Last week, we looked at King Edwin of Northumbria and ended with his death in 622 to 623 at the hands of Cadwathlon and Penda. We ended with the subsequent ravaging of Northumbria by Cadwathlon and it splitting again into its constituent parts of Bernicia and Dera. This week, we will look at probably the most famous of all Northumbrian kings, King Oswald. Oswald was the son of Athelfrith, the pagan king who, if you'll remember, massacred the Britons at Chester. Upon his father's death at the hands of Radwald and Edwin in 616, Oswald and his brothers fled into exile and it was in exile that they were to remain until their young adulthood. Oswald travelled west to the kingdom of Dolreda, Dolreda being the kingdom of Gaelic speakers focused in the Argyll Peninsula. While it's easy now to see Dolreda as the forerunner of the kingdom of Scotland, which in many ways it was, at the time it was actually more of an outpost of the Irish, having, as it always had, very close connections to Ulster. It was recognised by all onlookers, most notably Bede, that the people of Dolreada were culturally very distinct from their neighbours, the Picts. They were divided from these neighbours by a mountain ridge which runs up the centre of Scotland, called in Gaelic Drum Nullaban, meaning the backbone of Britain. At this time, water connected people, while lands tended to divide them. So it's very probable that the Gael had always had a strong presence in Argyll, in Dolreda. It is from the Latin term for the Irish, which is Scotty, that we get the modern word Scot. The Dolreadans were essentially a collection of Gaelic-speaking tribes that had settled in the Argyll Peninsula, with the focus of the kingdom being on the hill fort of Dunath. It was among the Dolreadans that Oswald and his brother Oswiu sought refuge after the rise of Edwin. It was also here that Oswald, the son of a pagan king, was himself converted to Christianity. Dorida was home to the monastery of Iona, which was the hub for the spread of Christianity among the British Gael and the Picts. The monastery had been founded by St. Columba, Columkeel in Irish, a monk born in the 6th century in Tyrconnell, a kingdom in Northern Ireland roughly corresponding to present-day County Donegal, According to tradition, Columba was exiled from his homeland following an insurrection he instigated to reclaim a psalter that he copied at the monastery of another Irish holy man, St. Finian. Since a monk was forbidden from taking up arms, Columba was punished by being forced to leave Ireland, despite his insurrection being successful. He travelled to Dolreada and established a monastery on the island of Iona. It was from Iona that Dolreada and the Picts were themselves converted to Christianity. As mentioned previously in the last episode, the Irish church had some very distinctive customs that set it apart from the Christianity of the Roman missionaries. The one that most aggravated later writers like Bede was their means of calculating Easter, which differed from that of Rome, and which caused them to celebrate Easter on a different day than Rome. Also, it was the custom in Ireland for cathedrals to be attached to monasteries, a custom that confused the English observers. It was at Iona, and in this environment of Irish tradition, that Oswald was converted to Christianity. Importantly, Oswald was converted prior to his becoming king, unlike Athelbert, Eadbald, Redwald and Edwin. While we must be careful of accepting Bede's extremely saintly image of the king uncritically, it does seem that Oswald was a sincere convert. This is not to say that the others were not also sincere, but in all their cases, there was very clear political gain to be had from converting. There may well have been political reasons for Oswald's conversion too, but these are not as recorded as they are in the other cases, if they were there at all. We don't actually know much about what Oswald got up to during his exile, apart from his conversion to Christianity. It's possible that he may have done some fighting in Ireland, since there is a Saxon prince named Osalt mentioned in the Irish mythological poem the destruction of Dordega's hostel. But this is entirely speculative, and we have no way of knowing whether this is indeed Oswald. 
Oswald firmly re-enters the historical record in 633 with the death of Edwin's successors, Osric and Eanfrith, Eanfrith being Oswald's brother, who apparently returned to Northumbria upon Edwin's death. Osric and Eanfrith were killed within a year by Cadwathlon of Gwynedd, and it was upon his brother's death that Oswald opted to press his claim to the throne. We are told that he met Cadwathlon at battle at Heavenfield near Hexham. Here, Oswald defeated and killed Cadwathlon, despite leading a much smaller army. There are two written accounts of the battle that come down to us. The earliest comes from Adavnan's Life of St. Columba, who claims to report a story given to him by Abbot Segena, who had apparently heard it from Oswald himself. In the story, Oswald had a vision of St. Columba the night before the battle, who told him that God had ordained his victory. Upon telling this to his followers, they were overjoyed and vowed to be baptised. Bede offers us another story, in which Oswald personally erected a wooden cross and got his army to pray before it with him prior to the battle. While we don't know which of the stories is true, if either of them is, in both of them it's made clear that Oswald's Christian virtue, compared to Cadwathlon's vice, was the cause of his victory. Upon defeating Cadwathlon, Oswald assumed the throne of Northumbria. He also claims that at this point Oswald was the most powerful king in Britain. It's difficult to tell, though, to what extent this is hyperbole. Oswald certainly does not seem to have retained Edwin's influence in Man or Wales, so in this regard his power was probably more limited than Edwin's. It is clear, too, that he also sought to cultivate alliances with other Anglo-Saxon and British kings. Possibly he had Dol Reardon support from his time in exile. In around 638, too, we're told that he orchestrated a marriage between his brother Oswiu and the daughter of the North British king Royth of Reged. He also served as the godfather at the baptism of Kinegils, king of Wessex, at some point in the 630s. Bede also makes reference to the children of Edwin fleeing Britain entirely out of fear of Oswald and Eadbald, indicating that some kind of alliance probably existed between the two kings. It's also clear that he sought to expand the Northumbrian dominion. The wedding of Oswiu seems to have resulted in Regeds finally being absorbed into Northumbria, probably through Oswiu's son, Ulfrith. We are also told that after Oswald's death, a monastery in Lindsay refused to take his body because he'd ruled over their kingdom as a foreigner, indicating that he either continued Northumbrian control of Lindsay, or that he had reconquered it at some point. Oswald also seems to have conquered the North British kingdom of Gododin. Edinburgh, the central hub of Gododin, was besieged and occupied by the Anglo-Saxons in the year 638, and when Edinburgh re-enters the historical record in the 650s, it was a part of Northumbria. Thus, we can speculate that Oswald's Northumbria had destroyed and absorbed Gododin. One key relationship in this period was between Oswald and Penda of Mercia. No one is entirely sure what the relationship between the two kings was. In fact, it's not even certain that Penda was still king of Mercia during Oswald's reign, although he certainly was king again at the time of Oswald's death in 642. Penda was sheltering Eanfrith, the son of Edwin, whom he betrayed and had killed at some point during Oswald's reign. This action has invited a lot of discussion, since some scholars, such as Nick Hyam, have suggested that Penda killed Eanfrith as a means of currying favour with Oswald by removing a potential dynastic rival. Others, such as D.P. Kirby, have suggested, though, that since Eanfrith seems to have been the son of Edwin by Quenber, who, if you'll recall, was daughter of King Chael of Mercia, he may have posed a potential threat to Penda's rule, and thus been killed for reasons entirely unrelated to Oswald. The difficulty in interpreting events like this arises mainly from the fact that we know Mercia and Northumbria were frequent enemies in this period, so it's tempting to see their history as defined by confrontation. So, for example, it's also tempting to read Oswald's cultivating alliances with people like Kinegils and Eadbald as a means to try and effectively contain Mercia's influence south of the Humber. But we don't actually know if that was the reason for his cultivating those alliances. We don't know how confrontational Mercia and Northumbria's dealings were on a daily basis, so we must avoid assuming that all of Penda's or Oswald's actions were meant to undermine each other. But since we lack the evidence to really make a decisive statement either way, it does also remain a viable interpretation, even if it must be made with some caution. Certainly, Oswald was an extremely powerful king. There's no doubt at all about that, even if Bede's 
image of his overlordship is somewhat idealised. While we don't have as many references to wars on his part as we do with someone like Edwin, it does seem that he nevertheless managed to expand and solidify Northumbria's area of dominion, either through war or through peaceful means, as in the case of somewhere like Reged or Wessex. It's not really as a military overlord, though, that Oswald is primarily remembered. Rather, he's mainly remembered as a saint and as the king who reconverted Northumbria. Following Edwin's death, Paulinus had fled for Kent, and the nascent church in Northumbria lost its royal patronage under the kings who reverted to paganism. Oswald, having converted in exile, desired to restore Christianity to the kingdom. So upon his becoming king in 633, he sent to Iona for missionaries. We're told that Iona first sent a bishop called Cormon, who was rejected by the Northumbrians for his severity. Cormon eventually returned to Iona and was replaced with another bishop called Aidan, who was apparently much more effective. Unlike Cormon, Aidan was a more charismatic preacher due to his being more compassionate to his audience. Oswald and Aidan seem to have formed an extremely strong alliance, with Aidan preaching in Irish and Oswald interpreting his sermons to his people. From this, we also learn that Oswald, despite being an Anglo-Saxon, was apparently fluent in Irish. In 635, Oswald gave Aidan the windswept tidal island of Lindisfarne, where Aidan established a joint monastery and bishopric along the Irish model. The choice of Lindisfarne is itself also a sign of how closely Aidan allied himself with Oswald, since Lindisfarne is extremely close to the Benician royal seat at Bamborough. With Oswald's support, Aidan oversaw the spread of churches and monasteries across Northumbria. Indeed, the rugged peaks and islands of Northumbria were ideal for monasticism, and the monk bishops of the Irish variety were perfect for spreading Christianity in this part of Britain. It also helped that Oswald developed a reputation for great personal virtue. We are told by Bede that he was generous with the poor and sincerely pious, a reputation that was soon to secure his eternal place as a saint of early England. Some scholars make an awful lot of Oswald's favouring the Irish church, in contrast to Edwin's patronage of the Roman one. This is to some degree a result of Bede's preoccupation with the superiority of Roman practice over Irish. It's not clear to what extent, though, that men like Edwin really understood the difference between the two traditions. Among ecclesiastics, though, the difference was clearly recognised, since despite Oswald's mission to reconvert the kingdom and his completing the stone minster in York in around 637, the Pope did not appoint an archbishop to Northumbria during Oswald's reign, despite Gregory's original plan for an archbishopric to be established at York. Probably, this was partly a result of Oswald's ancestral focus being in Benicia, and thus at sites like Bamborough and Yevering rather than York, which was the traditional focal point of Dera. But regardless, the snubbing of Northumbria's new Irish bishops may have been a result of Rome's desire to exert more control north of the Humber. Despite the customary differences, though, between the Irish and Roman traditions, men like Bede, who were resolutely advocates of the Roman position, still presented the Irish missionaries as men of profound holiness, and Oswald as an especially saintly king. This saintliness was only enhanced by Oswald's death in 642 at the Battle of Mazafield, where he died at the hands of King Pender, who was, if you remember, a resolute pagan. While writers like Bede never explicitly refer to Oswald as a martyr, his traditional title as a saint, that being king and martyr, clearly infers that his death constituted a martyrdom, and thus was essentially a way to secure his sainthood. Where exactly Mazafield was isn't entirely clear. It's usually located in Oswestry, a place now located in Shropshire, but which at the time was part of the Welsh Kingdom of Powys. The battle was fought between Oswald and Pender, as already stated, although the Mercians may well have had Welsh allies. Indeed, there are bardic poems and sources from Wales which allude to the kings of Powys being on the side of the Mercians. The way these bardic sources present the battle seems to suggest that Oswald may have been the aggressor, and since Oswestry is very much south of the Humber, if this is the site of the battle, it would certainly support the idea that Oswald was the one raiding into Southumbrian territory, rather than the other way around. Oswald was killed there by the Mercians, and his body was dismembered 
with the head and limbs being displayed on stakes. Grisly details that also added to this narrative of his martyrdom. The sight of his death, and particularly the sites that housed his relics, all became quite quickly sites associated with miracles, which are the cornerstone of any ascension to sainthood. The case for this sanctity particularly attracted Bede, who made it a main focal point of his whole characterization of Oswald, even to the point where he supplanted Edwin as the chief saint of Northumbria in Bede's eyes. Oswald was also the first Anglo-Saxon saint to gain a notable international reputation, largely again through Bede, who was respected across the Western world as a man of great learning. In a way, we could argue that Oswald's life, and especially his afterlife, mark the beginning of the English's emergence as a unique Christian culture within a wider Christian Europe. But in the short term, Oswald's death had quite dire consequences. It saw Northumbria again divided into Benicia and Dera, and a period of Mercian ascendancy under King Penda was cemented. This was short-lived though, about nine years in total, since Oswald's brother Oswiu continued to rule in Benicia, and successfully reunited the two Northumbrian kingdoms, setting the stage for a period of Northumbria's greatest cultural and political dominance among the English kingdoms. But this will be the focus of the next episode. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. I hope the new microphone that I'm using isn't going to be too much of a problem for you. If it is, let me know and I'll see what I can do about it. I also would like to request that if you've enjoyed this episode or if you've enjoyed previous episodes, that you leave a positive review or a like or whatever it is you do on whatever system you use to try and help us get the word out there. It really helps us and I'm eternally grateful for all the positive feedback I've been getting. But for now, I'm your host Tom Kearns. This has been the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. Thank you for listening.